It's the most wonderful race of the year. I feel like I should sing that. It's the most wonderful race of the year. It's about beauty, style, resilience and suffering. A bit like hanging out with me. There are sprints, there's time trials, there's mountains and maybe even snowstorms and a flood. Very biblical. It all starts on Friday in Budapest. Of course it does. It's the 2022 Giro d'Italia and this is our preview. Paolo, you are home. Tinkle those ivories. I'm OJ Borge, welcome to the latest Aerogram podcast for Peloton magazine, in which we look ahead to everybody's favourite Grand Tour, and we really think it is. The Giro d'Italia, the Corsa Rosa, the fight for pink. As ever, we expect drama, a hard Ford race, and joining me is the cycling correspondent to The Guardian, the journalistic version of Michelangelo's David, it is Jeremy Whittle. Jeremy, put some pants on. And author, podcaster and long-suffering Leeds fan, uh, Peter Cossins. So then... Who's not been wearing the mask and already has Giro fever? Well, I certainly am really looking forward to it. I always look forward to it massively because it's just so cinematic. It's so atmospheric. It is the big contrast to the Tour de France as well because it doesn't have the same corporate feel. It's chaotic. It's uh, theatrical. It's operatic. It's the Giro. Oh, that is a wonderful way to set it up. I must admit, I, I've only ever been to the Giro once, actually, in person. And I had been to the Tour beforehand, so I went to the Tour first, and then I went the following year to the Giro. And there is such a difference. I was used to the Tour, where you can't get close to everything you need, your pass to get anywhere, you can't talk to the riders. And the Giro, when I went, whatever it was, six or seven years ago, Peter, it's so friendly. It's so open. Yeah, I think it... Well, I was talking to Jeremy about it earlier in the week, and... Um, Jeremy described it quite nicely. as it's, it's a bit like the Paris-Nice of, of Grand Tours where um, you, you can get access to everything. You can kind of get what you want. Everybody, Everything's a bit more relaxed. It's like, I mean, like Jeremy says, it doesn't have that same corporate feel. And I think, think one of the other things from the competitive side of it, you look at the field this year and you look down and you think, there's about a dozen guys who could win this race. I mean, there, there are guys that have won it before. There are guys that have been close to winning it. There were guys who who were coming through and looked like they could potentially win it. But nobody nobody really stands out. And you can look at the look at it and think, I've got really really got no idea who's going to win this race. And that what makes it exciting looking ahead to Friday. Mm, absolutely that. So one year on, we're back at the start of the Giro. A year is very much a long time in bike racing. As Egan Bernal, Giro winner in 2021, can testify the Colombian continues his remarkably rapid recovery. And it really is, considering how injured he was uh, from his horrible training crash earlier this spring. Uh, there were lovely images him posted this week by Ineos of him training with Richard Carapaz. Uh, we'll look at who's in the frame to claim this year's Maglia Rosa after we check out the parkour. And the first thing that strikes you is the start. It's in Hungary. Jeremy, do you dig this? Well, initially I would have said no, not really, because I'm. You, know, you look at the transfers, and there's a very long flight um, to Sicily after the first three stages. But then I started looking at the parkour, the course, a little bit more, and I started thinking this actually looks really like the first three days will be will be really good because the um, first day has a snippy finale um, to the stage with a five percent climb at the end, so you might already see the GC riders having a go even on even at the end of the very first stage in which sense it might be like that opening stage of the Tour de France from last year where Julien Alaphilippe won where we had like crazy half hour to the crazy last hour of the race with lots of crashes and then a very steep climb at the end and then um, you've got a time trial the next day so and then a sprint on day three before the transfer but 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 so those first three days could be really good so I, I do dig it. Do you? I mean, do, do you dig it in the sense that Hungary is one of those countries, it's ruled by a strong man in Viktor Orban. And we've talked a lot on this podcast about cycling going to places that might have dubious human rights records. And obviously, there's the ongoing, um, the ongoing problems in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine with Russia. And I know Hungary has been chastised a bit by Europe. Do you think that's an issue? Do you think it's an issue to be going somewhere that is being chastised by the international community? I just thought you meant, do I like the route? And I like the route. Well, no, I, I sort of did. I sort of did in the same way. I mean, do we dig it as a whole thing? Because you can like a route somewhere. You can have a route anywhere. The route's great. Do we think, do we think morally it's a good start, Pete? I mean, I've been reading stuff today about uh, Russians being excluded from the, the, the qualifying competition of the, of the Women's World Cup or the European Championships or something. And you, you kind of, uh, 
I, I don't know where, where, where you draw the line on this, which, which country should be in, which country should be out. And we had a conversation recently about, about Eritrea and, and um, the, the regime there. We've had conversations in the past about Rwanda. I mean, I, honestly, it's, I, I, don't, I don't know where we stand. I mean, I can see where, with Russia that they've invaded Ukraine. It seems fair enough. But, I mean, if, the fact that we don't like Viktor Orban, Orban's, politi- uh, Orban's politics... It's really neither here nor there. I mean, we could have had a, a situation in France just 10 days ago when Marine Le Pen got elected president. Would we all then have boycotted the Tour de France? I, I doubt it. I mean, I think it's, uh, I don't know, just got to judge each case on its merits, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that Pete's got a point, but at the same time, I'm going to take issue with him because I think, think that sounds a little bit like the David Le Partien argument, which was his argument was like, oh, well, nobody liked um, President Trump. You know, and it's 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 kind of like, I, I think I have I hadn't really thought to be honest. I hadn't thought about the situation in Hungary, and now you've brought it up, it does make me feel a little bit uneasy. But then I think the problem is that the, we are in such a place in the world at the moment where there are numerous kind of unsavoury regimes. In fact, it seems to be growing in al- almost almost in number where where you could raise issues. So it's very difficult for cycling. It's a global sport. You know, it's, it's co- totally kind of embraced globalisation. It's wanted globalisation for years. You know, it's wanted to be big in the States. It's wanted to be a big, big in new markets outside of Europe, outside the old traditional markets of, you know, Belgium, France, Spain, Italy. That's happening now. And it's bringing up these interesting questions, isn't it, more and more? Mm. I mean, you you are very sensitive to this, Jeremy. So I guess if you hadn't thought about it, it's not such a bad thing because Hungary, it's a European country. It's a beautiful country in lots of ways. Budapest, from what I hear, is a beautiful place to be. Did you know Budapest is two cities either side of the river? I knew that, yeah. Buda and Pest, yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> Spring riding, it is back, and Hammerhead's Carew 2 is the only bike computer with predictive path technology to help you get more out of your rides. And I know this because I have one, and it's wonderful. Explore with confidence with the most advanced GPS navigation and routing available, and its exclusive climber feature to see upcoming gradient changes in real time. And if it's a big change, you can weep onto its waterproof skin. Get your Carew 2 today at hammerhead.io. Use promo code AEROGRAM, that's AERO, A-E-R-O, gram with two M's and an E, to get a free custom colour kit and exclusive premium water bottle when you purchase a Carew 2. That's hammerhead.io, promo code AEROGRAM. Or if I was going to say it as it's written, AEROGRAME. I mean, looking at the route, Peter, is it a typical Giro route for you? Lots and lots of climbing, lots of big hills, lots and lots of drama from the off. It is really. I mean, they've, they've. I mean, Jeremy talked about the Hungarian stages. They they then transfer to to Sicily, and then they just whack them straight in the face with the big mountain mountain summit finish on on Mount Etna, first day first day in Italy, and that's kind of typical of the Giro, basically. I mean, we've seen before on on Etna, it can be a stage where not much happens if there's a strong headwind blowing. They they all kind of stick together, and nobody really gets any any time. But we've seen other days. Other other stages that there were people have managed to kind of forge a bit of a gap, and it's going to be interesting, especially with the time trial twenty seven k in Hungary so early on. You look at the likes of uh, of Tom Dumoulin, who's obviously won this race before, and he's kind of the, on paper he's probably the strongest time trialist in the field among the Grand Tour, um, among the favourites. Maybe that maybe that will give him an advantage, give him a chance to, to gain some time on the pure climbers, the likes of, of Carapaz, Simon Yates, one or two others, Jai Hindley and, and, and Bora have got a, a bunch of bunch of pure climbers, as have Bahrain. It, it might it'd be interesting to see how it works out in those first few days. And you just kind of beyond that, you just get a lot of punchy climbs. You get flat days for, for the sprinters, and then there's, there's, they, they just keep bringing in these, these punchy days all the time. Yeah, which is what you love. Did you say 27 kilometres in Budapest? Because I think it's only not, I think it's less than 10. I think it's 9.2 kilometres, that time trial stage. Oh, right. Maybe, maybe, is it 27 in total then? Maybe that's what I've read. It's 27 in total, yeah. Which is an interesting point, Jeremy, because it really is a, it's a lack of, it's a lack of time trialling. It seems to be low. And we've had drama on the final day of the Giro before with time trialling. We know it can create drama, but it seems very, very sparse this year. Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because... You know, it's, I, I wrote a piece quite recently for um, the late lamented Pro Cycling magazine about the lack of time trials and grand tours and how they were really going out of fashion. And then they came back in, and then of course we had the cliffhanging finale to the the pandemic tour with um, 
Primoz Roglic and Tadej Pogacar, La Planche de Belfi. So time trials are always good if they're at the end of a race and there's a tight gap. You know, you can you you, you always get loads of drama. But but I mean, I think this this Giro looks pretty well balanced in terms of time trials. They're just they're just pretty short, um, and it's it's kind of you would think though the the final time trial will kind of be a ceremonial time trial because the stages before then, I mean, we'll have a talk about them in a minute, but the stages before then are so brutal that you can't imagine there'll be any 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 room for doubt by the time they by the time they're at the final time trial. I would have thought. Yeah. So, so what, what did you come to when you wrote that article about the lack of time trial? And what did, what was the what did you come to? What was the summation of it? Well, the the the, the conclusion generally was that um, race organisers think they're boring. Audiences think they're boring. They they worry that you know they drain the attention span of the of the the youth audience that they're going after now. Um, that you know people who are used to TikTok and Twitch, OJ Twitch. Having watched the time trial in the Tour of Romandie the other day, which was quite actually quite a good time trial because it had an unexpected outcome, I kind of was I was kind of like not bored, but it you know it, it does seem very it's very passive, isn't it? Viewing you have to kind of write re really into slow motion porno pictures of the riders churning a big gear to kind of get off on it, and it's kind of like it is asking a bit much, I think, of people maybe to have like a really long time trial, maybe a short you know snappy time trial. A crash bang wallop time trial is okay, but well, but to give you a okay, to give you a cricketing analogy there. So I, I like a time trial. I love a time trial. I quite like the data. I personally think it's a failure of how they present the time trial. I think it needs much more, much more data, much more almost Formula One levels of data. I think it needs interesting camera angles. I think would make a time trial much better because they are interesting. They are nerve wracking. There's so much stuff going on with managing of efforts that I think it's just not presented particularly brilliantly but secondly it is a skill that's part of cycling it is you know it's not just about climbing it's not about just being a ruler it's about being able to nail those time trials it's about the most complete cyclist that wins a grand tour would it be like cricket losing the five-day format peter if time trialing went out of cycling altogether i, th I think it to an extent it would i mean if they haven't always been in the tour but uh, they've been in the tour or, or the grand tours for for a long time and I think, like you say, there's. I mean, I think most of the riders would agree. You've got to, you've got to be an all-rounder. You've got to be able to climb in the mountains. You've got to be able to cope in the crosswinds or on the flat, and you've got to be able to time trial. That's the kind of that kind of provides us with the best rider in, in a race. And if you, I mean, you, you can adjust those levels, and obviously that happens all the time. It's happened all the way. I mean, you look back at in the Oncatil years and the time trials were immense and if you look back and think well well of course he won five Tour de France because I mean he was a good climber but he was he was riding like 60 70 kilometer time trials and we kind of moved away from those ridiculous days but I almost think we've, we're going too far now and I, and I agree with you that you're just not really given enough insight into what's going on in a time t trial I mean I was watching um, Ethan Hayter win the the opening prologue of the uh, of the Tour of Romandie the other day, and he was talking about going through, coming through the last corner at seventy kilometers an hour, and you just think that that's phenomenal. I mean, riding at seventy kilometers an hour anyway is, is phenomenal for me, but going through a corner that quick. I mean, you saw, when you saw how tight the corner was, the control, the skill that's involved in that, and it's just it's just not presented in a way that you can have any grasp of what's going on and and, and kind of gauge uh, that rider's skill and all the riders skill and i think that's something like you say that 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 does need to change you sort of feel you sort of feel they need to take computer games or formula 1 as the method i think for that because you know the course you can set cameras up you can almost give it a cyclocross technique you know where they've got i saw some really interesting shots i can't remember which which race it was recently but they were using drones to film it which obviously a lot more maneuverable a lot a lot lot cheaper than, um, than using helicopters and the shots they were getting were phenomenal and there was there was a, there was a there was a, a fixed gear race in America which they did in a car park which they shot with drones as well and it was amazing to watch and if we're, we're chasing Jeremy if we're chasing this TikTok generation surely they just need to be a bit more ambitious a bit more creative with how they present a time trial so the issue is not the time trial; it's how it's presented. Yeah, I'd I'd really agree because I think that um, you know it's very prosaic the way they're presented. They haven't changed the presentation presentation of time trials since the kind of 
the post-war era. They have, they haven't changed at all. All they've done is vary the distance, and maybe they've made a few of them kind of more oriented towards a summit finish. But but when the when the most exciting aspect of a time trial is a rider stopping to change his bike for a lighter weight bike for you know steeper gradients, which was kind of the highlight of the Tour of Romandy stage the other day, watching 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 them do their bike change and see see how much how swiftly they did that. When when that's when that's the highlight, you think this this is, this stage has got a few issues, but also I think you know why not why not have a time trial that that involves a gravel section? I mean I I mean we we're going to debate that endlessly. I'm sure this summer, <laughs> but why not? Why not? How about one with jumps? How about one where they hit a jump and they leap a bus halfway through? Well, why not? Why not? Why not have a gravel section where you know they're not allowed any assistance and the cars have to go yeah. past, and if they have a flat, they have to run. I don't know. You know, I mean. There are just things they need to do because I think that more and more you're going to alienate an audience and you're going to be stuck with an a- with an aging audience. And you know, I'm not I'm not a big fan of kind of t- turning it into wacky races. But at the same time, there's harsh realities. There's harsh commercial and marketing realities that that you know, all sports are dealing with. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think this could be a podcast in its own. I really could. I mean, I, I think it's get less about maybe I'm trying to argue it from less about changing what a time trial is itself with having. I mean, I'd be totally for it. Put, put a cobbled section on, change a bike for that, make them use three different types of bike in different places. It's more about how we present the information. There's so much information. I feel this about cycling anyway. I, you know, and I, I feel like cycling has all this data of watts and, you know, heart rates and what's going on. I think put microphones on the bloody riders. Let's speak to them while they're racing, especially on a, a time trial stage. Um, and if Formula One can make changing tyres interesting, I'm pretty sure cycling can make a 10, you know, uh, the the race of truth against the clock. Anyway, uh, let's go back to some of the climbing. Uh, you guys are students of these courses. What's the one stage, Pete, that gets you salivating? If there was one stage across these three weeks, which one should we all sit down and break out the popcorn for? Well, th- the one the one I really like is uh, it's probably not the one that most people would expect, but I mean, it has got 5,000 metres of, of vertical gain. It's stage nine to the top of the blockhouse. And it's just such a, an iconic climb, um, Eddie Merckx won his, I think it was his first stage win in the in the Giro there in 1967. He took an absolute hammering from Jose Manuel Fuente there in 1972. We've we've had kind of classic stages up there in the past. The weather can be awful, and it's, I mean, it's it, it's a brutally hard climb because they 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 come up. I mean, it, it tops out I think at 2100 meters. Or I don't think they're going quite that high actually, but. Um, they they climb up basically almost from sea level, so it's it's massive. I mean, they're they they're not climbing from a considerable height already, and that's obviously coming. It comes just before the the first the, the second rest day, I should say, because we've got three this year. It just comes before the second second rest day, and it's going to be interesting to see how it all pans out there because that's the I think that's the first real chance for the the climbers to make a statement, and we'll we'll see who's who's who are the riders who are going to kind of push for the Maglia Rosa in the, in the final 10 days of the race. Yeah, so I think stage 15, before the second rest day, 177 kilometre mountain stage, that's going to be a big GC day because they can go all out and then they've got the opportunity of respite and recovery the day afterwards. But then the next step, the next stage, which is stage 16 to Africa, again is another monster. And interestingly, it includes the Mortarolo, which is a dreaded, loathed, climb one of the one of the one of the hardest climbs in all the grand tours perhaps the italian anglerio i don't know i don't know if that's a good comparison but i think maybe a lot of people think of it that way and interestingly that had that has a descent almost into the final kilometer so they come off the climb there's a six i think six or seven k drop and then into the final k um for the um for the finish of the stage so you know you th- is that is that the day when these things really take shape Rather than the kind of mammoth stage, which I think Pete was alluding to earlier, stage twenty, which is the San Pellegrino, the Passo Pordo, or the Passo Fadaya, because by then maybe the dice have already been rolled, you know. So maybe maybe it's kind of around that second rest, that second second rest day that that things are really gonna we're gonna really see things shake up. I mean, the, the thing with the Giro is you, there were so many mountain stages all the way through. You never really, I mean, that, that's the beauty of it, you've, of the race. You never really know when it's going to take off and how. I mean, that's that's why we, we're all kind of glued to it and what makes it so fascinating. So, I mean, it, it could be Etna, it could be the Blockhouse. We might have to wait for, for the Fadaya on the penultimate day before we before we get a decision. But it's going to, it's just going to build and build all the way through. 
And that's that's what the Giro does. I mean, it's it's captivating racing. We we know probably in the final week there's going to be some bad weather up in the mountains that could shake the whole thing up again. I mean, just just bring it on, basically. I can't wait to see what wait to see what happens. The the weather the weather is an interesting thing when it comes to the Giro. The year the year I went, um, I must admit, I was I can't remember the name of the top of the climb. It was the one where oh, who was it? I think. Whoever came off the top, it might have been Kreiswijk, where he came up to the top and he basically just cycled off the road into a snowdrift. It was this crazy race where they went over the top and there was just snow. But you get that with the Giro, don't you? That when they go through the high passes, they have those days. And isn't there a famous story where somebody was frozen to the bone and they had to unclip his hands from the bike in the end? Who was that? There's there's a very famous day from um, the from the Giro that Andy Hampton won. Um, when they went over the Gavia and, and they, they all had to kind of like uh, huddle in farmhouses on the way down and get into cars at the top and be given flasks of, you know, iced, uh, iced tea, hot tea, hot tea and coffee and stuff like that. And, and, and then, and then, and then the end, there's this famous, famous story of a few riders peeing on their hands halfway down because their hands were so frozen on the descent. Um, but that was the, that was, that was the day the big men cried. I remember, always remember reading this fantastic article kind of years and years ago. That, that said it, it was the day that the, the big men cried. Oh, well, you see, if I'd have heard that story, the headline I'd have gone for, the day the Giro wore yellow. There you go. You could have heard that one. <laughs> tell that, good, that, tell that headline. Um, so, yes, it is. The, the, the parkour is wonderful, as always, for the Giro. We're very much looking forward to all of it, including the paltry amount of time trialling. Uh, but let's talk about favourites then and how their form is, because as was, as was said at the top of the show, we have such a great cast, such a great cast of people who are young and want to win this race, people in form, outsiders are going to go for it. So, Jeremy, where are you looking for the 2022 Giro winner this year? Who are you looking at as being the main protagonist? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you'd think that, his, not history, maybe destiny would dictate that Simon Yates would finally lay the ghost of the the, of the 2018 Giro when Froome won and destroyed him on the Finestre and his leadership of the race fell apart after having completely dominated for the best part of two weeks, or in fact over two weeks. So you think you think that he's got this he's got this monkey on his back that he's got to get rid of finally once once and for all. I mean, he said a couple of years after that, he he uh, when the when the Giro started just before the race began he gave a press conference i was i was there and he'd given a quote to ruler the um magazine where, where where he'd said that if i was if i was one of my rivals i'd be shitting myself at the prospect of racing against him and i asked him in the press conference i said do you stand by that and he said oh yeah absolutely and he bombed he totally bombed and <laughs> was he talking about demula it was just <laughs> mocking it, well, yeah, well, it should have been. Yeah, but Vin- Vincenzo Nibali was just mocking him and laughing at him, and you know, he kind of it was the worst thing he could have said. So he's got not humble pie to eat, but I mean, and obviously he's a fantastic rider. And you know, everybody will, would have seen the stage he won in Paris, the final stage, how, how spectacular that was. So you know, he's been in great form as well. So you th- he's coming into it in great shape. But then so many other riders there as well: Roman Bardet, Richard Carapaz. Miguel Angel Lopez, you know, there's there's a wealth of riders and we're, we're trying to find out, but plus maybe Damiano Caruso, who won the Tour of Sicily earlier, early this spring. So there's there's a whole wealth wealth of riders there. You haven't really put your money on anyone there, Jeremy. You haven't put your money on anyone. Come on, where, where are you going to go? Who do you think this year, if I was going to bet? And of all my vices, I'm not a betting man. OK, I think Richard Carapaz will win because I think he's due, he's due another Grand Tour win. He's been second in the world to third in the Tour after, after he won the Giro the first time. So I think, he, I think he's due another win. And they've, 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 got, they've got a tradition now of winning this race because they won with Teo Gagan Hart. They won, obviously, with Egan Bernal last year. So let's see if they can make it three in a row. But if it's not, if it's not him, then you're looking at Yates. And I mean... Again, as you say, OJ, the romantics choice is Vincenzo Nibali. And I, I am interested in the fact that a couple of these stages, yeah, you know, he's 37 now, but a couple of these stages, they look, they've got his name on them. They really have. Especially that, that Mortirolo stage looks to me like pretty much an ideal stage for him. But I just don't think his climbing legs are as, uh, as sharp as they used to be. So he's an outsider. He's just, he's 
he's just a great person to have in the race. Although when anybody calls him the nibbler or the shark of Messina, I do I do die a little inside when I hear that in commentary. <laughs> um, Pete, where are you going? Because there is romantic choices there, as as Jeremy said. Can I mention? Yeah, the the most romantic choice. Come on, OJ. On. You know it, you know who it is, don't Mikkel you? Mikel Lander. Mikel Lander. The unluckiest man in cycling. <laughs> it's got to be. <laughs> does it, why? Why does it? Well, it, if if he's going to win a Grand Tour, this is surely his best chance. I mean, there's not an outstanding favourite. I mean, you, the Ineos Grenadiers team's incredibly strong and they probably start as favourites with Carapaz as their lead rider. But Bahrain have just been in absolutely scintillating form in through through the early part of this season. When you saw Lander at Liège-Bastogne-Liège, he looked in absolutely phenomenal shape. I mean, God knows what he was doing, pushing pushing the pace up so high, so far out. I mean, it was it was ridiculous. I mean, the tactics were all over the place from that team. It was almost like he couldn't <laughs> hold himself back. And I just think this is it. This is Landismo. We're going to see Landismo re- reborn. We're going to we're going to see the culmination of it in this Giro. I love the idea. Mikel Landers' head is just thinking. Pete, Pete Cossins has said, this is my year. Watch me fly. <laughs> it's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> I don't know. When, is he, when has he ever looked like he's going to win a Grand Tour? I mean, seriously, when has he ever looked like he's going to win he, a Grand Tour? He did. He did. I don't know if I've, like, time doesn't exist anymore, but um, I don't know whether it was last year or the year before. And he did. And then we did a podcast and Pete said, Mikel Lander, Lander's going to do it. And I think pretty much the, the podcast was was released. And I think pretty much Lander either crashed somebody or rode into his him. form dropped off or somebody <laughs> rode into it. It was like, is he is he the unluckiest man in cycling? No. He's always, there always seems to be either of either of a, a twist of fate or a teammate that gets in his way i mean often it's it's a teammate that he's kind of got to back down because when he was at astana they they just kind of favored other riders over him and i mean he probably lost out at, at sky because of that as well and i don't know if if it if this is if he is going to have a time this is it it's got to be because uh, he's cracking on a bit now i just don't see him as just don't see him as even a podium contender, I'm afraid. Uh, there'll be there'll be a moment, kind of probably in the second half of the race, where he'll just slide backwards, and the the the, the front group will go away, and he'll just he'll just be sliding backwards. It sounds so horrible to say that, doesn't it? Given the guy's the guy's career history and his achievements, but you know, as I say, when has he ever looked like he's really going to win a Grand Tour? So I don't think he's done like he's a man in cycling. I think he's reached his level. I think that's his level where he's at. I think he, he does look like he's going to win a Grand Tour, but it's normally for about eight or nine minutes where he looks unbeatable and then he'll do <laughs> yeah, something yeah, yeah. and then he'll just get yeah. real back in. But um, excited to see what he can do. Um, what this year has been, if we look through the Spring Classics, we've had a couple of riders, Matthew van der Poel and Van Aert, thinking of them, who've come into races and, you know, we've all gone, oh, I don't think they'll do anything. Matthew van der Poel's had a back problem. Van Aert had COVID. Um, and following that through... What do you think of Tom de Moulin? Because uh, of Jumbo Visma, he's back in first Grand Tour since the Vuelta in 2020. He's had, you know, he's had issues. He's been off the bike. He's had some time away from racing. He comes back in. What do you think, Pete, of his chances here in this race, especially with the fact that there is an early, and it's not a very long one, but there is an early uh, time trial? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say with uh, with de Moulin, doesn't it? I mean, he's not really shown any form at all so far this season. I mean, I'm just kind of scanning down his results earlier and, <clears throat> nothing nothing stands out but I don't know, just get the feeling with, with Jumbo that they're so well organised and um, they'll have, I mean he's obviously been preparing, training for this race he'll have been at altitude and whatever at, on, on the, in Tenerife I guess and maybe maybe this is his, his, his way back into the sport in, in, up to the top level maybe this is it that He's won it before. He knows what it takes to win. He probably could have won it. Uh, there was another year, I think, when he, he was taken out in the first week where he was probably the favourite to win as well then. He's, there's something about Dumoulin in this race that they're, they're kind of... It's almost like he finds himself in this race, I think. And the, the climbs suit him. They're not, um, they're not the kind of climbs a lot of the time where he's got to do massive changes of pace like there would be in the Vuelta. And often a bit more in the tour as well. They're kind of they're long and they're they're they're, they're steady. They they kind of suit his his way of climbing as a ruler. He's got a strong team around him, but 
I mean, I'd have to say I'd favour more Mikel Lander finishing on the on the podium than, than Tom Dumoulin at the moment. But I wouldn't be surprised if Dumoulin did it because he's got the track record there. And he's just he's just a wonderful, wonderful guy as well. I mean, of all the people that I've I've interviewed over the years in cycling, he's just he's wonderfully verbose and he's wonderfully thoughtful. I think him being back at the top level of cycling is a good thing. Uh, and it is a deep field of many talents away from the people who we think are going to win the Malia Rosa. Uh, Matthew van der Poel is making his debut. Uh, Caleb Ewan's there, Gaviria, Nizolo, lots of sprinters with... Jeremy, for the Giro, I think there's a fairly decent amount of chances for them to win stages, including Mark Cavendish, who will be at the Giro, I think you said for the first time, for a decade, which also means it's unlikely for him to be at the Tour. Ne- nearly a decade away, yeah. And it's it, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that he is riding this race and uh, you would assume then, wouldn't you, that he's not going to go to the Tour de France. But... I don't know. He could he could do both. There's there's enough of a gap between the two of them for him to do both. But I don't th- I don't think at his um his stage of his career that he'd want to do two grand tours so close together. Uh, there are loads of well loads. I said loads. There are probably half a dozen pure sprint stages there. I've I've when I when I've gone through the route, I've got kind of like six, back six kind of nailed on the sprint sprint stages. So he's got. Decent chances if he's if he's in good shape, but then look at look at the riders who are also there with him. It's a stronger field actually than last year's Tour de France in terms of sprinting. So I think it'll be harder for him to win stages in this Giro than it was in last year's Tour. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting to with with Cav. I mean thinking back to uh, when he did ride the Giro fairly regularly early in his career, he I mean he did he did win the the the, the points jersey. He's done that all in all three Grand Tours, but he had this tendency, like a lot of sprinters do at the uh, at the Giro, of pulling out after a couple of weeks and then kind of um, getting himself into shape for the Tour. I mean, we've I could I could see that happening again. I mean, if people are saying it's obvious he's going to ride the Giro, Fabio Jakobsen's going to ride the Tour. Maybe that, maybe that is Quick Step's plan. It, it seems that that's what Patrick Lefebvre has been saying. But we saw last year; it's not as straightforward as that. The thing things can happen in. I mean, we're still two months away from the tour. Things can happen before then. I mean, if Cav suddenly was to win, were to win four stages, beating Caleb Ewan all ends up at, at the Giro. Quickstep might might rethink, and uh, so it, it's it's going to be interesting to see what he does. I think. Interesting, interesting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how he approaches it as well. Um, we haven't got a lot of time left. I just want to end on this. Now, we know Italy. Is so romanticised when it comes to cycling. We've talked about the beauty of the Giro. We've talked about the beauty of the scenery and, and what it's like to go ride there and the passion that the Italians have for their bikes. But where is Italy with it all? There's been no World Tour team since 2016 with Lampre, Merida. Where are they? Does it matter that they don't have a World Tour team anymore, Jeremy? I think it does, yeah. I mean, I think I think for, for the cycling industry in Italy, for the fan base in Italy, for the kind of media coverage of Italian cycling as well. I think I think it's it's you know given this is the land of kind of so many fa- famous brands and so many legendary riders, you know, Colnago, Fausto Coppi, Stelvio, Pinarello. The name goes, the names go on and on. You know, they're all they're all iconic in the history of Dr. cycling. Dr. Ferrari. So, yeah, they're all iconic in the history of cycling, and and, and you know. It is weird, isn't it, that that they don't have a world tour team, and 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 is that to do with the account with the Italian with the Italian economy? Is it to do with the lack of you know the lack of victories in 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 Grand Tours in recent years? I'm not I'm not really sure. Is it is it even a hangover from kind of doping scandals in the past because they had a really bad period? Um, they had they had a worse period, I'd say, than the than the sort of France did at the Giro with sustained doping scandals over several years um, that began with Pantani and then went on and on. Um, so I don't, I don't know. It's a bit, uh, it's, it's, Italians are sports mad. And I think more perhaps than any other nation in Europe, even maybe even more than the Spanish. But I, th- I think the lack of a kind of really iconic rider, France is probably a good parallel because they, 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 while they have, you know, Roman Bardi and Thibaut Pinot, they don't have a kind of household... I mean, they're well-known in cycling, but they're not really quite household names, I guess. And they don't really have a household name in Italy. And, I mean, you know, we had a house, we had a house, household name in Britain, 
It was Bradley Wiggins briefly, and and it you mean you know, we all saw the massive influence that have in America. They had a household name Lance Armstrong briefly, and they know the the massive uplift they got in cycling there as well. So it's just the lack of a real superstar. I think I think that's it. Yeah, I th- I'd agree with Jeremy actually. I think it's less the teams and, and more the personalities. And um, if you look at the sports that are popular in in Italy at the moment, of course football always dominates. If they um, European champions at the moment I mean they always have their, their, their club teams are almost always amongst the most competitive in Europe or full of major stars and whatever motorcycle MotoGP is very popular F1 is very popular and they've got they've got big I mean they've got big names big big teams that um, represent the country and you don't really have that in in cycling I mean Nibali in, on the Grand Tour stage he's, he's their only well proven proven winner of the last few years and, and there's nobody really coming through to replace him we've got the likes of I don't know Ciccone I mean they're probably the biggest star at the moment is Filippo Ganna and uh, I mean people have said oh maybe if they they created the right course with a lot of time trialing and the climbs weren't so hard that maybe like Francesco Moser did um, at, at Jira in the past that, um, that, that Ganna could come through but they haven't really got an exciting ride they haven't got a Pogacar or I mean, even if you look at um, the, the likes of other riders in that team, like Juan Ayuso, the, the young Spanish kid who's coming through now, there aren't Italians like that that are kind of making making everybody excited. I mean, I mean, if, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it, Nibali remains this kind of flagship figure, this iconic figure. And if you think about what happened when he won Tour of Lombardy, and I think it was 2017, and then he went on to win Milan San Remo the following year, and there was this kind of you know frenzy. When I remember that when he when when he crossed the line in San Remo ahead of head of the chasing group, and you know won by like three or four seconds, and it was this kind of like, like you know f- just a frenzy of explosion of joy in Italian cycling and in his, and in Italian sport because he's the one he's the one rider who kind of really really unites the nation and you know excites people. Um, Beyond that, as you say, with Ghana, it's like kind of, you know, everyone knows what a fantastic time trialist he is, what a great ruler he is. But um, that's not the same as a guy who wins who wins alone in the mountains and who comes over the climbs, you know, and descends like Nibali does. It's just not got the same appeal. And the, the Italians really do love, I remember talking to Daniel Freeb, who we, we all know, um, written extensively about Italian cycling and knows, knows Italy really well because he's lived and worked there for years in the past. And he, he, I remember having a conversation with him years ago and he was saying the thing is they love beauty so much. It's not enough to win. You have to win it has to look beautiful. It has to kind of, it almost has to be erotic, you know. It has to be this kind of sensual experience watching a lone rider, you know, climbing through one of the great passes, whether whether it is the Fadaya or Mortarolo. And, and they haven't got anyone who can do that at the moment. I thought for a second you were describing my presenting style there, Jeremy. For a second, I was. It's an interesting one, and, and I think I think it is it is something that we'd love to see back on back on the big stage, eh? an Italian World Tour team with the superstars to go with it. And that is pretty much it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you very much to Pete. Thank you very much to Jeremy. Uh, and we head excitedly into the first Grand Tour of the season with a bead on full of Val Poligella as we bid you a hearty ciao. I'm OJ Borge. Thank you for listening. Ciao! Ciao, ciao, ciao. Ciao, 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 ciao. This has been a Big Ring production for Peloton magazine. Peloton is an award-winning print and digital magazine available worldwide. Known for quality, design, long-form storytelling and historical features. In the past 11 years, Peloton has become the go-to cycling magazine for serious cycling fans and enthusiasts around the globe. Please visit pelotonmagazine.com to learn more about our membership options. And it also smells great when you open it. Give it a sniff. Smells wonderful.